Whoa! I think I think we're live. <laughs> so I'm just responding to the chat over here because we already got Erwan uh, and Pete and Eric. Who knows who else? Mark is here. Man, I wish I could go to Earth. Um, I got one vacation this year, and I'm taking it, and it's going to involve absolutely no technology. <laughs> I'm going up to a place that has literally no internet access. Hey, what's up, Phil? All right, I think I have everything going. I have this printer. It's the new Ender 5 with Duet Maestro on it. Uh, I don't know if you've been following that one, but that one is all up and running. I only damaged it slightly, crashing uh, the nozzle into the bed because my Z offset was much too high. So, uh, new bed will be here tomorrow, but it works. So, I'm going to print a big vase in it in. Uh, uh, the new printed solid Jesse PLA uh, something blue. Uh, hey, what's up, Hawk? And Ump45, also known as Lars. Uh, man, you know, sometimes I think uh, YouTube unsubscribes people. Because there's people I know I've subbed to, and then I'll go and I'm not subbed to them. So I'm doing fine. I'm actually um, feeling a lot better. Uh, I've been plagued with the flu and then stomach flu after that so um yeah i have none of that at the moment so we're gonna have a really fun stream uh, <laughs> and then we've got never let the machines win and justin so yeah you know the i've been outside too except for it got cold today it's like 30 in the last day or so instead of like being the 60s uh, <laughs> i was trying to be right here plus i got a new toy to play with so and this thing worked. So the Zender 5 duet has been a, a dream. I don't know if anyone's ever seen duet stuff. It's uh, kind of amazing. Uh, playing with Marlin and then going to RepRap, uh, just using like, the auto web configurator to auto config your printer is pretty sweet. Uh, whoa, 12.30 a.m.? Well, I'll be quick. I'll unbox it really fast. Let me just check my... Um, let me just check my print here, make sure it's heating up correctly. Uh, should yep, it's starting to home now. For yep, Whew. yeah, do it's awesome. So let me grab the box. Let me grab. Let me grab. It's a big box. It's heavy. It's thirty pounds. It's a big box, man. Like, look at this thing. <laughs> um, Form 3 is probably going to win. But it is a lot more expensive. So, uh, but yeah, it's a huge box. It's 30 pounds. Uh, it's open source. It's fully assembled. Uh, I'm going to set it down on the ground, open it up, and pull everything out piece by piece. The first thing we'll notice when I open this thing up is there will be a little box containing all the bits and pieces yeah it's it's mostly air like most of this is just a whole bunch of padding so nothing can damage the printer so let me set this thing back down that's just the printer but there's just a lot of packing i mean it is very well packed there's a lot of air in there Oh, we got the accessories box. The wide angle lens sure does help. Let me, there we go. Um, yeah, here's the SL1 accessories package. I think I might be missing a few things. Here's my, here's my beta test paperwork. We'll hide that. Uh, of course, the first thing we're going to notice here is orange resin. Of course, you can ask a question, Hawk. Yeah, we got some orange prusament resin. That's it's not called prusament; it's called pr prusa. What's up, Oscar? Uh, that's actually the Mark 2.5 bear that's loud, and the clicking. Yeah, I guess the clicking. Yeah, um, it's uh, doing the whole fancy BL touch. So yeah, it's definitely clicking away. We've got a spare sheet of FEP. We've got. 
tools. Oh, there's new tools. We've got snips and a scraper and a blade. And so they gave me, this is a different toolkit than last time. There was a bigger scraper. Now there's a little scraper, a plastic one and a metal scraper and a thingy. A really tiny memory card, 16 gigabits. <laughs> Crusa juice, Crusa elixir. I'm okay with any of that. Uh, this is actually pretty nice. This is a funnel with a filter inside. So there's a small mesh filter in there, so bits and pieces don't get poured back in. Even though I do recommend never pouring back into the original container, but I'll get to that later. Um, oh, someone sent me a print that was printed on this printer. <laughs> um, how? So one of the benefits of my brain, which is an unfortunate benefit to me, is I can digest a lot of information quickly and I can retain the most pertinent information as long as I keep up with it. Well, isn't that pretty? So they sent me a print of me. Let me hide my face. They sent a print of me printed on the printer, and it's uh, basically perfect. So I don't know which one of the guys from Prusa printed that, but muchos gracias, senor. Um, so yeah, I've only been printing since for like two years, but, um, yeah, it's just, it's just one of those weird things where, um, my brain works in a way, as long as I keep up with something, I'm, I can retain a lot of details. Like same with photography. Like I, I knew so much about photography before I could even take a good picture. Um, now this is fun. This is a drip tray and I'll show you how this works. Uh, I mean, you can probably get the gist of it. You put this over. And then while you're pulling stuff in and out of the printer, it drips into the tray, not dripping onto your printer. So uh, I'll show you how that works. And then there's a US power cord, because last time they only sent me um, European standard cords. Um, compared to FDM, the struggles are learning an entirely new thing. Uh, from that and the cleaning. The cleaning is the biggest struggle. So keeping up with the maintenance and making sure your machine is running properly and you're not like, pouring resin in, in holes that aren't supposed to be filled with resin. And just generally the 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 cleanliness. It's it's definitely, if you're someone who do, doesn't like to stay clean, you know, like if you're a mechanic and you're just used to being covered, like I can never be a mechanic because my hands just get covered in grease. I just wear gloves and I get dirty. I'm like, I hate this. Um, I don't hate being messy. I just hate working while my hands are here. Like I need to clean them. Um, Yes, I had the SL1 working. I found the one hardware bug. And they they were like, send it back. We'll send you a different one. And then they found out what the hardware bug was. And they're like, cool, we fixed it. It shouldn't be a problem in future releases. So that was the whole point of beta. I found the one hardware issue, like physical hardware issue. So uh, we've all been finding little like uh, firmware issues and stuff. But that was the accessories kit. It's It's actually a really nice accessories kit. <sighs> um, I already have a plug plugged in, so I don't know why I pulled this off. So one of the things with SLA printing is you got to keep track of this resin stuff. And I'm gonna give I'm gonna give you guys my uh, 101 on your safety. So um, if you've never handled resin before, they come in many different shapes and sizes. We specifically use 405 nanometer uh, light sensitive resin. Uh, resins can have anything from a sweet smell to a kind of caustic smell depending on the type of resins and resins can vary from the standard like you know modeling resins where it's just a nice hard plastic when it's dry to flex to an ABS type to a nylon type to uh, Lycrete one of the beta testers uh, he's been testing Lycrete uh, resins and there's uh, resins for dental work and resins for casting so we have castable resins um, I don't know if if, um, uh, if they make these in-house. I'm guessing they don't, but I will find out if I can. Um, they seem to have a lot of it. I have I have six of these now because I ran out of one, and they sent me four more. <laughs> and then they just sent me another one with this kit. And then the original kit came with a full liter and a gray. So I have a lot of this orange resin. Um, 
The hardware issue that I found apparently had to do with the Z. They didn't give me too much. It had to do with the linear rail. So I think it was installed slightly incorrectly. So it was it was jutting, and they were able to figure that out and fix it. Uh, might have been like a shipping thing where it got bad, you know, banged around too much. So, but that was fixed, and now they know what to look for. And if we ever see the print issue, I know exactly what it is. So we'll know how to we'll know how to fix it, which is great. That's the best part about um, um, the stuff. But back to the resin. Um, the smells can change and vary. So the Prusa orange resin is very mild. The Prusa red that you see here is also very mild, but has a little bit more of a acrid smell. So it's kind of like, you know, if you go into a factory and they make chemistry, there's that just hint of something um, that isn't, that just so smells man-made and chemical. Um, I've tested things like Wanhao resin and I literally wanted to die. I had such a headache um the whole basement smelled of resin it was it was a horrible experience for for anything uh and then i tried fun to do which extremely mild resin hey what's up guys we got two more yeah you can never have too much orange um i got some saraiha saraiha blue, blue which is another amazing resin again very mild um photon resin the any cubic resin is very mild so you will and again these are to me, and this is the sad part, is depending on your sense of smell and your acuity to different chemistry, these can all smell different to you. So this might smell fine to me, but someone else in your household um, or yourself might just think this is the death plague. Uh, the other thing is uh, allergies. People can be allergic to resin. Let me move my pop filter a little bit so that way it doesn't pop on there anymore. Um, no sense of smell definitely helps, uh, but it won't stop you from having an allergic reaction. So some people can be allergic to resin right off of the bat, um, and you won't know until you become in contact with it. And um, it will leave you definitely feeling very unhappy. Um, and the other issue with resin is what's called uh, sensitization, where you're not allergic to resin, but you come in contact with it. And that's physical contact, not, uh, not, not just inhaling it, but physical contact, and eventually your body builds a sensitivity to it and you end up being allergic. So you touch it and you get like a mild case to a major case of anaphylactic reactions. So um, I highly recommend buying the smallest bottle of resin you can get if you're thinking about getting into this. Open it up and find out if you are, um, you know, and it's very, it's not, it's pretty rare. Uh, most people are fine with it. This is definitely the rare occasion. I don't want to scare people, then you're going to die when you open up your container. But, um, oh man, Kendall, is it, <laughs> I, will, I will sidetrack from the resin to save it user-friendly. Murph, uh, Murph, I helped uh, Shane set up his SL1 at the, uh, the uh, Prusa booth. And he never set one up. He hasn't been able to test it because where he lives, he has a lot of small animals, frogs and lizards and stuff like that. So he never opened his up to test. So I opened it up, set it up within 10 minutes and had it printing without an issue. Like, I think it was less than 10 minutes. So if it's fully assembled, all you have to do is run the calibration screen and it works. It's easier than a Prusa. I guarantee that. Um, yeah, the Zortrax Inspire looks. The Zortrax line looks amazing. I've been watching Joe from 3D Maker Noob rocking that Zortrax whatever whatever, and it's they're they're super amazing. They make some great printers. So, um, yes, you will know pretty quickly. Um, there are some resins that will immediately give me a headache. Uh, one of them being the Wanha resin. You know, just opening that resin and letting it get in the air not only is it obnoxious to me but it immediately gave me a headache and that's usually a sign your body doesn't like it um, if you have a hard time breathing then you definitely have an allergic reaction to it not just a you know a sensitivity you know a sense uh, a sensitivity to it because a lot of things like a lot of people are just sensitive to smells in general like my father hates candles and smelly things so um if I were to open up a sea breeze, whatever candle and light it in the house, um, he would not be a fan of it because it would give him a headache. He just doesn't like fake artificial smells. After it's cured, there's almost no smell. 
Um, yeah, it might smell a little bit like plastic, but after it's cured, it's safe to touch and it's safe to, uh, you know, safe to handle without gloves and it's safe to uh, uh, smell and leave around. Uh, yeah, ABS does give me a slight headache. I have ABS on this printer, the orange guy over here, and it gives me a minor, minor headache. Like I'll, if I'm sitting down here too long while it's printing, um, and I'm really close to the printer, I will get a mild, like just migraine pain, like right in the side of the temple here and here. And it's it's nothing I can't work through, but it's definitely annoying. Um, but again, everyone's different. Some people print gallons of ABS a day, and they're just like, whatever, no effect. So that is my one PSA. Um, for getting into resin printing, just be careful. Uh, the minority, you know, the major minority will have a slight effect, and then the even smaller percentage might actually be allergic to it off the bat. And then when you're handling it, just make sure to use proper care. Uh, always wear gloves. I recommend um, anything that says nitrile. So you want nitrile gloves. Uh, these are my, I've just been using these standard nitrile gloves since like forever. But these are temp resistant and chemical resistant and whatever. And if you're latex, uh, if you have a latex allergy, these will be fine because, you know, just don't use those plastic ones, like the Subway food handlers that make your sandwiches. Don't use the plastic ones because the resin will eat right through that, so. Um, <laughs> when am I getting a rail core? It's, I'm being adult about it and putting a very little bit of amount away every time I get some money. So, uh, but yeah, definitely get yourself a set of nitrile gloves. Um, I usually eat through a 50 pack in a couple weeks with resin printing because you're handling a, a lot of resin and I have a waste bin that's just, just for throwing stuff away. Um, you don't have to be that... Um, particular, but you're not supposed to dump this down the drain and throwing the gloves in the general trash, you know, whatever. Um, not a good idea. I had to drop it off all at the, um, uh, down on the super west side of town, we have the recycling plant. They'll take hazardous stuff for free so I can jump off, you know, old resins and I have a dump bottle. So, hey, what's up, Chris Freeze? So yeah, nitro gloves, step one. Step two for things that you need, it's of course the resin. Uh, but no, definitely for your safety, this. Um, goggles are definitely recommended. Um, I unfortunately never use them, but I might have to add them. Uh, I do have a pair of safety glasses, but a pair of goggles, um, because sometimes when you're mixing things and shaking things, it could end up in your eye, and that's definitely the worst case scenario, uh, because there is uh, an eye warning on all of these, and also temperature sensitivity and light sensitivity, and don't get it on your skin. Um, yep, avoid direct skin contact, it says. Egg bunnies! Man, Easter's coming up so fast. All right, so that's it. I mean, it come, the printer comes with everything you need. Um, you'll definitely need the metal scraper. Um, I actually prefer to use a razor blade to take my prints off because the suction force on your aluminum plate, which I'll get to later, um, is very uh, strong. So let's get to the printer. Let's let's take out the bed, Jake from State Farm. I'm ready for Jake now. He's gonna answer all of our questions and I love it. Um, I'm gonna go put away this kit. Uh, but the only thing that you need, I mean, Prusa, it's not in this kit because I already have everything, but they'll give you some gloves and a respirator. Um, I would definitely add the gloves as your first purchase. Any nitrile, it doesn't have to be these nicer ones. I just prefer powder-free nitrile gloves because, one, I hate the powders, and two, they work for everything. So if you ever want to do mechanic work or clean the bathroom, good good stuff. <laughs> yeah, 14 isn't bad for, this is a 50-pack of gloves or a 100-pack. Uh, these are extra large. This is uh, ambidextrous. I don't know how many are in a pack. It should be 100 or it's 50. Oh, 100 pieces. So 50 sets of hands. So that's not bad. You know, that's that's really not bad. 14 cents a glove for your safety. Uh, you don't have to wear two. I mean, you can open this up and pour with one hand with a glove. And so let's let's crack open the printer because I know everyone's waiting for that. 
And it's got these ribs. Hey, what's up, Brad? So this is why there's so much box. There's just all this air, and then you can see the printer fits in this side. Oh, it's a printer. Oh, my gosh. Dun, da, da, dun. Dun, dun, da, da, dun, dun. I wish I had a band. Like a real YouTube station would. You know? Dun, da, da, dun. So, like most standard uh, SLA printers, there is a cover, and the cover is typically red or yellow. And the reason being is UV light cannot pass through certain colors, so amber, yellow, and red are very difficult for UV light to pass through. So it will keep your print from curing while it's trying to print. So, very nice. And then just a lift cover. It has really nice metal hinges. Like really nice metal hinges. As I try to yank this out of here. So anatomy time. This is what everyone's gonna call a vat. The vat is where your resin goes. Build plate, this is your build plate. This is your knob. This is your ball screw, and then your linear rail is back there. It is a fat ball screw. I think it's a 12, 12, meter, 12 millimeter ball screw back there, and a really beefy, uh, really beefy linear rail. So, uh, yeah, I've, I think I've only seen two Prusas damaged on shipping. Um, so basically, you unscrew the knob up here, which this is uh, printed in PTG. And your build plate comes off, and it is polished aluminum. Everything in here is highly flattened, polished. So this is definitely machined aluminum down to a flat surface. But well, then everything else is brushed aluminum. So it's this gorgeous brushed aluminum. Everything looks very professional. Oop, there's my face. So that's how the entire inside looks like. So everything is this just brushed aluminum finish, really big beefy screws. Um, there's some heft. I mean, this is a solid block and it CNC'd out. Um, it's not multiple parts. There's like, well, there's two parts, but it's mostly one giant block of it. And there are two screws, very beefy screws. Some beefy screws that hold down your vat. The vat just comes out. Now the vat is also made out of brushed aluminum. And inside is that FEP, which is basically a material that's very thin. Light passes through very easily. It's very strong while it's also very thin. Um, and it's also chemical resistant. So it's kind of like PEI. So PEI and FEP are very uh, similar in what they're meant to do. It's just that PEI is better for... Uh, printing with PLAs and FDM style and FEP. <laughs> we got a drum. Uh, and it's definitely stretched. And you want it stretched so that way it's perfectly flat and pretty. So this is a very nice assembled thing. Uh, they do a lot of screws in the back to make sure it gets evened out. And you'll do a crisscross pattern. So I swap these once. So that is your, your vat. Now that does have lines for a min-max. Uh, this is also machined aluminum in one piece, which is pretty sexy. Uh, now, the nice thing about these bats is Prusa made the outside lip. Hey, what's up, Chris? Uh, made the outside lips a little bit taller than the inside, so you can set them down this way without scratching your FEP. But be very careful, because anytime you scratch or mishandle this, you don't you're just making it harder for nice, pretty, soft lights to come through uh, there. And then underneath here is another piece of our technology, which this is our screen, and it's a tilt bat. So the tilt bat is pretty sweet. Uh, 
definitely not the common thing. That's the big difference between, oh, Jen, John, how often? Uh, usually you wait till it gets pretty hazy. It's very easy to replace. I did it myself. Uh, but you'll definitely be replacing it based on how much use goes into it. So if you're printing daily, all day, every day, it might be every couple weeks. If you're printing less often and you don't leave the resin in the vat all week, because <laughs> you should drain this thing and clean it uh, instead of leaving it uh, just general uh, care because the colors will separate from the resin. The, the colors actually don't mix with the resin. There are dyed resins. Uh, they're mostly transparent, but the, the opaque colored ones, the typically the dye is actually floating in with the resin, so uh, they don't, uh, they don't, they're not homogenous, so they can separate. So you'll end up with a layer of color on the bottom and a layer of resin on top. So you see like this clear, clear liquid on top and then that, and then you gotta, you gotta somehow stir it back together again while it's in here. Not pretty. So I don't recommend um, any of that nonsense. None of it. Um, again, all brushed aluminum. You can see the big ball screw back there and the linear rail. It, it is not gonna wobble. This thing is rock, rock solid. Uh, let's go ahead and plug it in. Now there are sensors in here. So it has a door close sensor right here. So when this door closes, it'll trigger this sensor. And I believe there's one on this side. Is there one on this side? Or is it just the one? It's just the one. So this side has the little sensor. Let's show the door is closed. Because uh, as the door is open, it doesn't want to do anything like print and or stuff. It'll move and do other things. Uh, tools. We need some tools to set this thing up and calibrate. I'm also going to need to update the firmware. There's a brand new firmware that came out today. So I made sure to bring over, and I just, uh, just made this right before the show. I ran an Ethernet cable from my Switch. And now I have a long Ethernet cable so that way I can plug this thing because it does do over the air updates. So I can actually update this thing via the internet. Uh, and we're going to do that. We're going to plug this thing in. We're going to turn it on. We're going to make sure this is in there, so that way I can do an over-the-air update. Um, and then I should have a memory card with models already on it, sitting on my desk over there. But there should also be test models on here. Um, if not, I can actually download the test models over the air. So let's close this. And turn it on. Is it doing anything? Ah, there's the on button. The back's just the power button. Now, this does have a gorgeous touchscreen. This is probably the nicest touchscreen I've ever seen on any device, uh, especially a printing device. It is a very bright, and <laughs> we'll never have resin. They will have resin in stock. Um, yeah, the screen is ridiculous, and it's asking me to do stuff. So let me turn this towards me so I can read it. Uh, welcome to the initial wizard. The procedure. So I need to skip this wizard, and I need to go to settings, and is it advanced settings, and firmware update? Oh, wait, hold on. Back, support. Oh, network. Wi-Fi off. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yelling at me. Turn it back on. SLA with soluble supports. I don't think that is ever going to come out. All right. We are back. Might have to download the firmware. It might make it easier. Wait, I have the message. Tell me how to do this. Let me bring up my message. And emails and this guy. So B... 
to settings, advanced, admin. Oh, I don't have admin. Well, looks like I gotta do it the old fashioned way. Let's download it. Heading over to the computer. And opening up a mail client. Yep, there's that warning. Don't worry, that warning is actually supposed to happen right now because it needs the new firmware. Dun, 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 dun. Downloading firmware. Firmware downloaded. And I need a memory card where is my memory stick this is fun you guys get to follow along while i'm learning this we're all learning <laughs> all right i have the usb stick here Let's place this memory stick. In the print into the computer. Yes, Jake, on this style of printer, yeah, you can load up the entire plate. So you can load this entire plate up with 10 Mies, and all of them will print the same speed as one Mie. Um, it doesn't have to be airtight. There's actually an air system that keeps the air in the printer so all right let's load that firmware into here e -gen. oh it's a big that's 158 mega gigabits of firmware and it is r1 Ooh. Is that a golden release? They never tell me anything. All right. Let's insert this fancy jigger. And let's follow along. Once it loads. Dum dum da 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 dum 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 da 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 dum dum. And then back. And settings and band settings and firmware updates. Boom and continue and fetching firmware. This going by really quick. Hope it's just to fetch. It's quick. Let's see. Yeah, new releases definitely take a while. Once they get a once they get it figured out, um, shipping isn't too bad. Yes, the cured wash station's over there. I've already I've already had it, so I got that with the initial one. Yeah, it can update for the, but they didn't. They locked out the admin stuff on this one, so I have no access to the admin panel. So I'm doing it the old-fashioned way, which is using a USB card. Um, and that is nice they do both. So it does do over-the-air updates. Uh, it's still in beta, so don't, uh, don't judge. Uh, but right now it's just updating. And look how nice you can see the screen at the angle that the, the camera's in. I mean, yeah, there is no losing the screen at uh, <laughs> no anti I knew who I am. Yeah, I think they know who I am, which is why they, they didn't uh, give me access to it. They made uh, a big thing. And let me go look at my other chat. I had another developer send me a message about this firmware. So let me read his message. Okay. Ah!
Man, I have a whole bunch of stuff to do. All right, it is updated, looks like, and rebooting already. <laughs> if this thing had a uh, update via uh, floppy disk, that would be amazing. Just that's why it's all big and chunky. You just slide in uh, the three and a half floppy right in there. Um, all right. Ooh, now it's updating. Okay, so it loaded the firmware. And now it is doing the update, updating, and it's updating the motion controller firmware. So it's making a nice loud noise with all the fans. All the fans are running. Yep. The back exhaust fan, the under fan, erasing the EEPROM. Oh, no. All right, go back. And... And back. Awesome. And control. Ooh. Settings. Hmm. Well, I don't have system info. Let's see what it says here. Ooh, looks pretty good to me now. Ooh, there's an online manual I can look at. There's videos eventually coming. Hold on, I'm gonna find I'm gonna find what I actually have to do. <laughs> uh, okay. Um that settings. Okay. Back. And let's calibrate this bad boy. So calibration is pretty easy. Um, I'll turn this towards everybody again. Impossible for me to see, but I can lean forward. Let me just turn the microphone. And since I can see the screen at a very harsh angle, but we're gonna go to settings and recalibration. And yes, I wanna calibrate. I was going to launch that build plate all the way to the top, even though I've already disconnected it. And it does have sensorless homing because it is running Trinamics drivers. Um, it is telling me something right now. Let me turn it so I can read it. Let's see. Insert the platform and secure it to the black knob. Done. Loosen the small screws. Now, this is the cool part. You can slide, and I'll show you an image of what it wants you to do. So this is the image showing you to loosen these two screws right over here. So I'm going to do that. And I think I have the tool for that. <laughs> Where, where's Joe Mike? He's got a better Lazy Susan. And those two screws are your pivot screws, so that way you can lay this correctly on the bed. So we'll, we'll go back to the next step. We've loosened those. Yep, we have unscrewed the tank, and they want me to lay it down at a 90-degree angle. So here's the image of it laying. This is actually pretty cool. Like, hey, do this thing. Here's a picture of the thing I want you to do. And next. Okay, move the tilt up. So there basically there's a setting that's gonna happen here that uh, if I push the button up or down, it's gonna move the tilt vat up and down. And you can't see that from where you're at. But what I wanna do is I want the tilt vat to hit the bottom of this. So that leading edge, I want the tilt vat to hit it. So that basically calibrates the tilt vat to tell it where perpendicular, or yeah, where, where it's parallel to the plate. All right, so we're gonna move up. If I remember correctly, holding it down helps. Yep. And there we go. 
All right, make sure the platform tank and tilt are perfectly clean. They are. Return the tank to the normal position and screw it in. Let's, oh, let me see what that step says. Okay, it wants me to. Wants me to do that and put these screws back in. I would have never figured that out with words. Now, the rumor mill is they're going to replace that with video. So these will be short little, like, three-second video clips of what they want you to do. So instead of the images with the arrows telling me, you know, screw this clockwise, because that makes it tighter. Now, it does mention that it wants them even, so I'm going to get them in flush, and then I'm going to tighten them down with both hands. All right. And OK. And check if the platform is properly secured with the black knob. Yep, it is there. Do not rotate the platform. Keep it straight. Yep. Double check here with this step. Yep. Okay. And now it's going to home until it hits the, the bottom of the build plate. All right. Now let's look at the picture here. It's going to want me to line up the edges. You can actually kind of see that. It's kind of crazy. It wants me to line up so that way it's... It's nice and straight. Close enough. And then tighten the small screws. Uh, be careful to tighten them each individually. Or each, uh, you know, uh, they want you to basically tighten them at the same time a little bit. So a little bit here, a little bit there. That way when you tighten down the bed, it's tightened down correctly. All right, oh, that was fun. Ooh, look at that tilt. I think that's it, if I remember correctly. Yep. Yay, we did it. We did a correct calibration. So, yeah, that was kind of amazing. So, if you didn't follow along, basically the calibration had us, number one, uh, make sure that we cal calibrate the tilting. That way it knew that it was uh, flush with the base of the vat. We then calibrated the level of the aluminum plate or the build plate to the glass screen. And then it's good. That's all you literally need to do. It's a very short uh, step. I took longer because I looked at the pictures and was talking and not paying attention to the build process. <laughs> But as literally, I mean, that is the entire calibration process. Uh, if you've never used a photon, there's like paper involved. <coughs> and it's a lot more intricate. It, it, and the manual was very poor at describing how to do it. The community and the photon community definitely was like amazing at helping me uh, level the bed on my printer. Um, other than that, man, it's kind of awesome that it just works. Um, so the next thing we need to do is add resin. So let me, I wish I had my Lazy Susan. I should print me a Lazy Susan. So back and control and home tank. Okay. So now that the tank is home flat, we can add resin in and we have to watch out how much resin is. So I'm going to check something real quick. Uh, print. Yep, there are four example items. The Eiffel Tower, the ring, the calibration test object, and so on. So I'm going to fill the resin in incorrectly uh, and show you how this works. So check this out. I'm going to go ahead and close this. And there's no resin in there. I'm going to start a print. So print. Examples original Prusa, blah, blah, blah. 
And it tells me that I need to have, well, it doesn't tell me anything until I hit print. There we go. So check this out. It's going to warn me that I don't have enough. So right now it's telling me I need at least 40% resin in here. So let me open this thing. I'll put a little bit of resin here. Let's see how good this thing is. We'll put a little bit. So let me get my gloves. Uh, there hasn't been any assembly beta test yet. Everyone that's been in beta has gotten a regular unit that is fully assembled. So I believe Prusa is making sure they can assemble it first. And while they learn all the assembly nuances, they can then create a better guide, and then they can send it out to beta testers to make sure. Um, or they might just do in-house. They might just send it to random employees like, hello, Juan, that works in... Uh, you know, tooling and die. I know you've never built a printer before here, build this printer. And it's the same thing as sending it to a beta tester. So uh, I'm gonna put a little bit of resin in here. Drop a name for that one, I'm on it. I dropped a bunch of names and they picked none of the names I put in. So maybe it's the opposite. Uh, so one of the things you should do is definitely stir your resin. Uh, I usually go in a circular pattern, not. So that way I don't get a bunch of air bubbles inside the resin. So I'll normally just do this. But you should shake your resin because uh, the color, again, will form at the bottom. So turning it upside down and giving a good stir. Um, starting the print with the air bubbles in there is definitely the incorrect method because the air bubbles will get trapped. So uh, you do want to let it sit. Uh, I am in a cold environment, so the bubbles take a little bit longer to dissipate. If you're in a normal, like, 25 to 30 Celsius area, the bubbles will dissipate much faster. But the mask, oh man, I don't have the mask. It's in my other box. They didn't ship me a mask in this box because I already have masks over, over there. Um, I'm wearing gloves. And I'll be careful. All right, that should be sufficiently stirred. So what I like to do is always pour from the same side, so I just kind of pick away. I always pick the Prusa label. That way, if anything collects, it's always on the same side of the, the thing. Let me move my phone. I'm going to hide that under there. And we're going to crack this thing open. Again, this resin is very mild. Um, it's also very orange. So let me go ahead and start pouring because there's light coming down. So put a little bit of resin in there, just a little bit. And we're going to hit print. And it's going to tell me that I don't have enough resin. How? How does it, how it knows there's, no, there's not enough resin? I don't know. So it does this thing where it slows down, and then it's going to be like, whoa. And there's raising. And it's going to yell at me, tell me there's not enough resin in there. Yep. Chris, please insert more resin. Um, <laughs> that is freaking sweet. Um, this is a beta 2.0. I don't know how it knows. I don't know if there's like a circuit in here or it can feel the resistance of when it hits a goo. I don't know. I mean, if you can feel the resistance of a liquid, that's crazy. So print, blah, 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 print. And print. And this time it won't give me a warning because there's at least 70%. It usually tells you about how much there is. Yep, it says there's about 70% resin left. And now it does a little stirring, so it stirs the resin, and then it starts curing. So there we go. Now it's curing. 
Oh no, it's actually doing. Um, oh, now it started. So that was just the mixing phase. It is a little swish washy, gets all the resin nice and mixed, and then it starts. And the first layers take the longest. I believe they're 45 second layers. So how it works is they, the, the, I wish I had like objects. So this is the build plate, this is the UV light. The build tank goes, and then in between, of course, is the FEP. So let's say this is the FEP, and then this is my UV. So this is the FEP on top of the UV, and it comes down to about uh, whatever your layer height is. So if it's 0.2 millimeter layer height, it gets to 0.2 millimeters away from the FEP. And it gets a very long exposure, and that long exposure cures the resin. Yep, and that's a good sound. That little pop means that it cured to the, the build plate and it, the FEP film popped. <coughs> So it cures to the, the build plate. The FET film has least resist, less resistance, so when it pops, it pops and lets go, and the little piece of resin is stuck to the build plate. And it does that for about three to five layers. Um, and those first three to five layers, you hear a pop, and then after that, there's no more pop because they're much shorter layers. There's a lot less bonding of the FET to the, um, to the material, but it bonds harder to the aluminum sheet because of the texture and the fact the light is hitting that fancy aluminum thing. And now we'll have the next one should pop again. Yeah, there's definitely a pop. So that's a good sound. So as long as it's popping on your first couple layers, that means it is calibrated correctly. And the FEP is dislodging itself from the print and it's sticking to the thing. Um, I wouldn't leave this particular resin in there for more than a day. Um, the resins will separate, the color will separate from the actual resin material. Um, hey, what's up, red light? <laughs> it's a kitchen scale. Um, it could be that, it could measure the weight, but it actually hits. So the plate comes out and actually touches the resin, and then it goes, no, there's not enough resin. So I know that uh, part is. And then with the smell, me sitting right here, I don't, I don't really smell it. It's very, 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 very mild. If I move... If I moved it like here, there's no scent at all. Uh, the resin doesn't have a price that I know of. So most resins are about $50 a liter, and you'll get a whole crap ton of D&D minis on a liter. Um, it doesn't run no legs. Um, but yeah, back to Rich. Don't leave it in there for too long. Uh, lemon scented, I wish. Um, yeah, definitely don't leave your resin in there for more than a couple days. Uh, if it's if it's a resin that um, is like a transparent resin, typically the dyes are actually in the resin itself, um, and they won't separate very quickly. So that one you can leave it longer. I've I've left them in there for a couple days before and printed just fine. Um, thanks, Rich. I like my channel too. It keeps me out of jail because I'd rather be here than on the streets doing weird things for money. <laughs> I'm gonna drink some some of my, my liquid here now, uh, but it's working. So is if you get your SL1 um, and you've set it all up and calibrated, and you start printing and you hear that pop, you're good. Um, yep. Um, I would not put the resin back in the original bottle. I know that's recommended. But you can go on Amazon, you can buy uv tight bottles. Um, they're just brown bottles with nice lids. And I would pour any of your used material back into that bottle. And then you can add new to old resin. So if you're going to you know, reuse um, uh, the old resin, you can pour it in there and then pour in some new resin if you need more. So I would definitely um, not mix it back in because if there's any particles that are smaller, um, so here's here's some basically talk about some issues. So sometimes little little bits can fall. Like you're trying to get the print out, and you won't notice it, but a little tiny thing will fall out and fall into the bottom of the vat, and it'll actually stop the print plate from hitting the bottom. And you don't want that ending up in your full fifty to sixty dollar bottle of of resin. Uh, not you don't want brown beer bottles. I don't know if they're actually UV um, protected. Um, you didn't miss much. We opened it up and it's printing. 
now we're just doing questions and answers for a while uh, until I feel too tired. I don't want to be on here too long either because I I actually have work to do. Um, <laughs> darn life. Um, but I definitely wanted to get it running and all that fun stuff. So, um, yeah, you can definitely mix it in the vat. Yeah, you could also use a light resident uh, or light sensor as long as it's not 405 nanometers. So you can put light on it, you just can't put UV light on it. Which, my lights overhead are LED, so I don't know how much UV that actually puts out. Uh, but I was working in the regular layer, so each layer is like six or seven seconds. My basement is a little cooler, so will this succeed or not? I have no idea. Um, it may or may not. All I can say is this print looks gorgeous. Oh boy, um, if I were to print this mini in the same quality, I'd probably need a 0 0.25 millimeter nozzle. Uh, printing this tiny mini with all the supports and everything would probably take forever. Uh, this print would take about four hours. Uh, the print that's in there right now takes four hours and it's a really super detailed model of Joseph with a bunch of things on it. So print times uh, can be lower and if I print 10 of these on a build plate, it takes the same amount of time as it takes to print one. Um, oh man, slicing models in Slicer, let's actually do that. Uh, it's super easy. Uh, let's, where's my Slicer? Okay, Slicer's right there. So let's screen share. Screen share. So we have Slicer. Don't mind my Ender profile. Uh, let's go to the SL1. Yes, I wanna change everything. We're going to the SL1. And we'll delete this vase. Um, so it has your nice build plate here. Uh, this is the nice thing about the new beta uh, slicer is it has the actual build plate. So you have some scale. Um, and then we can pick our resin. So uh, first we need to change the detail. So our details, there's normal, which is uh, 0 0.05 millimeters, which is, you know, you're it's pretty, that's pretty small on, a, on, a, on an FDM printer. You can go down to uh, 0 0.025 millimeters for ultra detail, but... We'll do that. And the producer already has about 100 profiles total. So here's our orange resin at 0 0.5 millimeter layer height. And we need an object. So documents, 3D printing, and to the test prints. What do I got in here? Do I have anything? Uh, yeah, we'll put a Benchy on here. Files and a Benchy. So here's our Benchy. Uh, we can print it flat on the base if we want. Uh, it's typically not recommended uh, because you'll be chipping it off of the build plate to get it off. Um, I'm going to just go with this, but uh, once it's here, we just hit the support button and you can hit auto generate supports. Oh, look at that, it's got all the little points and stuff. And there we go. And go back. I don't, you can see that it generated all these um, automatic supports already, and it did lift it. Yep, it did lift it off of the build plate. Now there's definitely an optimum rotation, so remove all points. And typically, you will print things at about a 45 degree angle, and that's just easier for the printer. And then we'll add manual supports, auto-generate, and we'll have a bunch of auto-generated supports. Boom, and you can see it uses a lot less supports because now you're slicing like this. We're gonna add a little bit more density here. So let's go to 130% density and auto-generate. There's a lot of missing pieces here. Let's see what the auto does if I up Update, yeah, that's a little bit better. And they do have manual supports. Uh, you can add manual supports by going here and just clicking points, and it'll add supports wherever you want and apply changes, and then I'll re-slice. And now you have those extra supports. So it's actually really easy to do all this fun stuff, and it really doesn't need this support piece out. 
Does it need that? It might need more supports. I think it could do that. You have to think a little bit differently when you're slicing for uh, SLA. Uh, but this is actually pretty good. And then we can go to the layer looker. And this will actually give me a better idea of how well this will slice uh, like this. Because you don't want too big of a piece just out in the open. Um, yeah, this isn't, I mean, this will definitely print. Let me check that little. Yeah, it's got the weight of everything. That should print just fine. It's basing it off the previous layer. So really, I think, so this is the only thing that's kind of hanging out in the open. So I definitely would want to put a support uh, right underneath this because this thing is unsupported when it comes out. Let me scroll down right there. So it's just like a, just like in the air compared to the rest of it. And it's very, very thin. So this might flip floppy. So you might want to add a little support there. But other than that, that's basically um, supports in, uh, yeah, in SL, in, in the, in the, whatever program that was, Slicer. Um, project, I d and so I actually am a DM, so I print a ton of D&D &D minis for our uh, stuff, but projects in general, I might start printing minis for people. I've always just kind of not done it because my photon tends to be unreliable. Uh, this has definitely been far more reliable. Uh, every time I hit print, I get something. Um, Uh, yeah, that's the maximum layer height is 0 0.1 millimeters. I mean, you can go higher, but your cure time would just be ridiculous. Um, yeah. Um, I don't know why they have not added click and play supports, but it is definitely in Slicer now, but it's only for, um, it's only for the SLA end of it, so... Yes, SL1 does have variable layer height, so um, you can use all of the features that you're used to. So uh, let me go back here. So we can go back to screen sharing here. If I go back to here, oh, we're already in that mode. Uh, we can actually do, oh, let me turn this thing off. There we go. We can actually add, um, you can do different settings. You can add pad heights. You can optimize. You can actually click an auto orientation if you want. Uh, but you can do uh, variable layer height. So if you wanted more, let's see here. So if you want this area to have more, um, let's see here. Yep, there we go. There we go. So you can add a little bit more a finer layer height here. However you want to do it. So... Yep, reset. We don't need any of that. So you definitely have the ability to add variable layer height and anti-aliasing and all that fun stuff. Um, yes, they are definitely adding uh, variable uh, supports. It just takes a while. It's still going. Good job, printer. <clears throat> that reminds me, you sent a message to this gentleman here. Okay, sent my message to the beta guy. But any other questions about the SL1 and or resin printing? Because this will not finish. Um, in any time. Uh, it has two hours and 33 minutes left. <laughs> print time is technically faster for the same quality. Um, if you were to print with a 0 0.8 millimeter nozzle, you could whip out prints really fast, but they wouldn't very, be very detailed. So this is specifically for detailed models. So if you were to try to do like 0 0.05 millimeter layer height with um, a 0 0.25 millimeter nozzle, uh, you know, prints would take forever. Uh, max wattage, that is a good question. I don't know.
I do not know. <laughs> yeah, you and I have used a photon, and uh, I've had it just shut off, I've had it just restart on its own. I've had it just do all kinds of fun things that unspeakable things. So, yeah, you know, could be worse. <laughs> Yes, uh, VP3D. All of the new stuff in Slicer is getting so much better. It's looking uh, like a major contender versus looking like someone's leftover Slicer from the 1990s. Yes, Eric, uh, the Cure and Wash station is on the table back over there. I've had it for a while. Um, Kurt, you can make them as flexible or as brittle as you want. Most resins are slightly brittle. They're just standard uh, resins because uh, that's just the way plastics are. Monocure makes what's called a Flex 100, which is an additive. So you can add anywhere from 5 to 100% Flex resin. Um, and you can make these slightly malleable to very malleable to uh, literally rubber-like material. Um, the, they make flexible resins. They're pretty amazing. They're very flexible. You can make a lot of... You can make cell phone cases with them. <coughs> Excuse me. So you can um, definitely uh, customize how flexible you want your prints to be. <laughs> Where you live. Oh, man, that's a good question. I live on planet Earth. <laughs> oh, I live in America. Yeah, I live on... I am Polish, but I do live in America. Um... Yeah, so a lot of brands make really nice flexible resins. Uh, Fun to do makes industrial resins that are very, very strong. Um, they're a little bit less brittle. They're very strong, and I I really like Fun to do ash gray industrial resin. Uh, it's one that I print a lot of my uh, minis with, and they turn out really well because gray resin tends to show detail a little bit more. Uh, these clear ones hide a little bit of the finer detail, but in general, pretty sexy. Uh, the City of Chicago has more Polish people per than Warsaw, so the state capital of Poland. So there's a lot of Polish people in the United States. Uh, Warkaki is the correct pronunciation, unless you're Polish, then you'd say Warkotski. Um, I am not nose nose blind. I can smell it from here. It's when I it's when I get another foot away. It's about uh a two-foot cone of smell, because what the Prusa system did was they took the um, uh, they took the uh, air circulation and they trap it inside. So whatever air is in here goes inside the base, where it recirculates through a charcoal filter, and then some of it comes out the back. Um, and fresh air is also inputted from the bottom. So um, it's constantly mixed with fresh air, a carbon filter, and then slowly pushed out the back. So... Um, yeah, it's actually not bad. Uh, definitely a lot of Serbians, so. Uh, 3D Mark, any resin that's 405 nanometer should work. I won't say all of them will work, but they all should. Most likely that nylon likes the fact it has a coating. That anti-grippy coating is definitely a fantastic feature. Um, I'm digging out of my slice nozzles, so um, that's that's pretty fabulous. These new technologies we keep getting, I like these printers with touch screens, and I can slide around and look at different menu options. There's a refill button and an up down and a pause and this way you can actually see the layer view so you can see what it's printing right now. It's so quiet too. Uh, June 9, 1389. Nope. No idea what happened in June 1389. I was not alive, unfortunately. I would love a Mark IV with a touchscreen. Um, I would really like a touchscreen. Uh, 
full bear SL one. Wow. Um, Jason, they fail for different reasons. You can definitely get um, the biggest issues is that peel force. So even with a tilting vat, so most printers they just go pull straight up. And that peel force, that pop that you hear is every single layer. So you're pop, pop, pop. Um, and uh, eventually that force can be so strong it rips the print off of the build plate and it just sticks to the FEP and then it just continues to print in nothing because it can't. And then you have a very messy cleanup process. Um, so very large objects can be difficult. That's why you, you would increase the density of your support. So like you can see the amount of supports that are on here are actually pretty high for this print, but safe. Uh, typically you would hollow this out um, before printing. So um, this is not hollowed out. So there's one solid piece of resin. If you hollow it out, you'll use less resin. You'll have less uh, force against it. So it prints a little bit easier. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I would also like a Mark IV. Um, I have this Ender 5 running duet over here. It does look like Gummy Bear. This clear red is super gorgeous. And it's so smooth. Like, when it's... I don't, I don't know what print settings they use, but it's just super shiny, smooth, and doing even closer. Look at that guy. He's just... You know, there's no FDM printer that prints that. It does look like you can eat it. Um, <laughs> there was no gummy bears in this box. So I do not want an E3D tool changer in Prusa, only because I want a rail core tool changer. Uh, Easter, I live in the Midwest, so in the middle of the United States. <laughs> I did destroy my bed on my printer. Um, no, no. <laughs> Actually, I could. Uh, I have a buddy who's a model maker or a toy maker, so you could take this model and reproduce them as different colors. Uh, <laughs> I will call Joseph and be like, "Bro, where is my candy?" <clears throat> Let's see here. Or yeah, full belt driven printers are pretty neat looking. I'm actually pretty impressed by um, the fact that someone actually sat down and, and designed that. Uh, a bigger Prusa bed would be awesome. Just a bigger. Um, <laughs> the Joseph that makes the candy was. He was too busy eating it with his milk. And that was scary. I don't know how. I don't. That I, I, I just. Yeah. Oh man. Oh, you get dessert. I got nothing. Five pound gummy bear. Um, I do have some sun kissed grape soda. I went to the, um, I went to the uh, barbecue, the butcher. They do barbecue every every Friday, Saturday, and you can't get barbecue without grape soda or root beer. That's just that's just me. Um, so I would I would dine on some grape soda in front of my orange Julius that's printing in here. I also haven't had it in years. I just was going through their soda stack, and I was just like, man, grape soda just sounds really good. Um, I don't, uh, yes, it will stop. It'll warn you, and it'll beep, and it makes noises, I think. Let's find out. Nope, it's still going. It'll probably warn you after a while. Ooh, pineapple soda. That's also good. 
and red cream. Man, you guys are just making me third. I know I don't really drink a lot of soda. I don't really drink a lot of soda water. So, um, and cream soda, man. See, I used to be a big soda guy. I mean, I'm already a big guy, like big, wide. But I used to love soda, man. I could I could easily hammer down like a six cans a day or more. Oh. Are these weird people joining the chat? Got a cam girl and Gerard Douche Sr. No, I don't think it's trolls. I think that's actually um, uh, spam, which is funny. They'll send links and then you'll find out who they are. It's the best. Ooh, Vicky 2 on the Mark III. That needs to happen. Uh, Joe Mike wants to put a Vicky 2 screen on there. Full Moon, I don't know. what it, What is it? it? Let's find out. Do I have an app for that? Yeah. Uh, Mini Chris, this size Mini Chris is probably three or four hours, maybe less. If it doesn't take very long. Does not take long at all to print a mini Chris. Yeah, the robots are weird, man. I, YouTube, social, I run a lot of blogs. Well, not a lot. I have blogs. And just the amount of robot spam that you get when every time you open up a, uh, a, you know, a blog, it starts to get insane. It's like, man. Ooh, Ender 5 duet. Um, I wouldn't do the Ender 5 again. Uh, the y, the Z axis is very um, wobbly. The it, It's supported on one end, so if when the bed does a Z hop, the whole thing just shakes up and down. It seems to work fine. Um, I Switching to duet, I was able to swap it over to you know 32x micro-stepping. On all the axes, so um, it made it a lot smoother, but it's still on fast prints. It just kind of goes up, um, <laughs> the, and that's why I bought a cheap printer, like three hundred and fifteen dollars shipped. So uh, plus, it was just learning. Um, yeah, it's it's a very unstable cantilever design. It's it's so unstable that um, you know. I want to rebuild that part. And I think I could make it a really good printer uh, with some uh, V-slot and some wheels and make another... Um, let's see. Hey, what's up, Felice? Um, yeah, but I definitely should go Railcore. That thing is the ultimate in everything. Um, either Facebook or Twitter or, um, the Patreon has a chat. Those are all the different ways. So, um, one issue with Patreon though, is if you send a chat to the, a chat chat, not a, um, oh, what is that? Um, uh, what is that thing? It doesn't show up in my phone. I have to go to the website on, on, a, on an actual browser. Uh, if you send a message through it, I get it. Let's see here. Where are... <laughs> It's a skewed view. He gets he gets a he gets a pass. Yeah, Barry, are your printers for sale on a website? I don't think they are. I think you just he just makes them. I actually moved his printer to the new table, and this is all going to get redone. I'm I'm going to put shelves so I can have more than one printer on a, on a thing. Uh, oh, what else? I think that's it, and then when the print's done, um, it, that's the that's the process where it gets pretty gross. It's um, not really gross. You put gloves on, you pop your print off. Well, 
you put your gloves on, you put the little drip tray right in front, and then you take your print off and you set it in. I usually set it in warm water with a little bit of soap. And then I put it in the IPA to put in the washing station. So the curing and washing station is over there. Um, I'll do a day of curing and washing. Uh, uh, oh, is uh, is it John that has the one with the 602? Oh. <laughs> uh. A rum and coke. I haven't had that in so long. You know, I haven't had I haven't printed too much of Amazon Basics PLA, but I know everyone had really good success. You can either try a higher temp or double check you don't have a partial clog. Because I bought filament that have unmeltable pieces in the resin, and I had to do a partial I had to do a co uh, atomic pull or a cold pull to get it out there. So yeah. The filtering is really good, and also make sure you get a good resin. If you get one hot resin, you're just gonna everyone's just gonna kill you anyway. There's no way to filter that out. Oh man, pick one. Um, I would get the rail core only because you can't tinker with this. There isn't like mods. Uh, the photon had mods. Uh, wait, what's up, country? Walter's in the house. Uh, but yeah, when you get when you get something like this, there's no tinkering. Um, I don't think there's uh, there is one mod I want to print, which is just a holder for the uh, the the, uh, the build plate, so that way it would drip into the thing, and that's something that the you know I think they have one, they just haven't released the STLs for. We got Walter. Walter's got some cool resin prints. By the way, Walter is the most huggable human being that you'll ever meet at Murph. So if you ever see him at Murph, Earth, or any of the Earths, you should give him a hug because he's so huggable. It's like, man, that guy. Any hints? Um, you know, there's so many new things with Prusa. Um, I have no idea. Uh, you know, I'm, I guarantee they're working on new, new printers. I haven't seen them. Um, Eric Rose, there are definitely some amazing high temp resins up to like above 200 C. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they make resins for almost every kind of occasion. So definitely high temps and definitely strongs. Um, Ooh, max temp. I don't know. There isn't a temp in there. Um, I'm guessing there's a max working temp, and it might yell at you if it gets too hot. Um, no experience with duplicator. I've seen prints from it, and they look great. Um, I like the MMU2S upgrade just for the sheer fact that it's measuring when it hits the Bontech gears. Yes, I will be printing some ducks, and I want to do them in. Uh, there's a black fun to do uh, industrial resin that's really good to high temp. I think it's like almost 200 C. So that thing excites me. Oh, 21st birthday! I will send all the gummy bears that are laced with alcohol and or C CBDs. Is that a thing? Is that what people send on 21st birthdays? The bear? Did you get a bear? Are we talking a Prusa bear or did you, are you like taxiderming a bear? I can never tell what you're doing, Walter. These are all things that I don't know. And yes, definitely be careful. Um, happy early birthday and be very careful with that. Uh, I remember my 21st. I had two drinks and went home. It's fabulous. Um, I wish I knew why MMU2S kits weren't shipping faster, but I think it's a production issue. Um, I don't think Prusa's capable 
of making a lot of one thing or a, a lot of multiple things. They can make a lot of Mark threes, but they can't make a lot of Mark threes and a lot of something else. And right now, I think people are still buying ridiculous amount of Mark threes. So, uh, dude, Walter, I didn't know you had a home built two point five S. That is going to be super awesome. Did you see the new extrusions I got in? I posted on the Twitter. He's climbing into the bear for warmth. Oh, uh, all right, Mark. You have a wonderful time taking the nap now. Uh, I will also have a fantastic weekend, and you do the same, because this weekend I'm going to take pictures of athletes for T-shirts. Um, yeah, that that gun, that uh, space gray looks crazy. Man. You streaming tomorrow, Walter? Someone ordered the MMU 2S as part. See, that's a that's a sneaky way. Um, oh, filming. I like that. Um, the beta test will probably continue beyond because there'll be all, all little refinements and little things that they'll send us uh, to take care of. Ooh, fun in the country basement will be Sunday. I'll try to get onto that. Um, I haven't been to one of those in a couple weeks, and I miss those. Those are my favorites because it's just a bunch of you guys having a fun time in the basements. Well, you're not in your basement. Chris is in his basement. I'm mostly there for Chris's basement. You and Glenn are just like the the, the cherry on the top of the delicious cheesecake that is uh, Chris's basement. Oh, Fun King is hosting. Oh. I've been talking to Chris uh, to do a video two-parter. So part A would be you know, him teaching me how to Marlin an INC retro. And then part B would be me building a Mark 2.5 um, uh, bear on the screen live. And then he'd help me with the refinements on it. Woo. Woo. Funcountrybasement.com. I didn't know you guys had a website. <laughs> Basement dweller. Basements are kind of an amazing place if you have them. Uh, I don't think Florida has the basements, do they? <laughs> oh, man. Um, Tom, that's a good... Thomas, good question. Will Prusa ever make colored extrusions? Probably not. Um, I wish they would do something. So the Matter Hackers Pulse is this printing system where you can buy a base printer and add cool stuff to it. I really wish Prusa could pull that off. Like you buy your Mark III, you know, let's say it's the Mark IV. It's some amazing 300 by 300 by 300 printer. You know, you can buy the base model, which is just a direct drive, you know, single whatever for this price. You know, heated bed, you know, flex plate, maybe, maybe not even a flex plate. Um, you know, whatever they want to do with that. And then you can add like multiple different flex plate options. You can add, uh, you know, bomb tech. You can add, um, yeah, you can add like whatever you want to your, um, your printer and then cash out. And then they ship you this, your own custom printer. But I feel they could mess that up. Um, you know, someone in the factory would be like, I'm going to put the wrong stuff in the wrong box and make everyone really unhappy. Yes, like laptop config. That, I mean, that's literally what I'd love to see in the 3D printing industry because, you know, some people don't want to tinker. Like, I would actually like to buy a printer with everything I want. That way I can just put it together the way I want it to begin with versus buying a printer and then going, you know what? I want all these other things on it. Good luck. So, one day. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's so weird when people say they don't have a basement. Like, where do you put your stuff? Like, this basement's a mess because I just have stuff. Yeah. 
But yeah, definitely custom printers. Like even in SLA, like you can buy the base model or for X number of dollars, make it double the height or wider or something or more sensors. You know, base model doesn't have the fancy sensors. So I, I'm just crazy like that, but. Ah, the garage is the basement. See, the garage also has stuff, but also has to keep the cars because we got that hail problem. Hail and brimstone comes to the Midwest very often. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Let's wind this down. It does give us a place for tornadoes, which is crazy. Those things are scary. We had one roll. We had a couple roll through pretty close, uh, but where I live, there's a, it's 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 a it's a it's a valley. So the tornadoes used to start early, and then when they try to go over the valley, they break up because they can't go down, or at least they can't go down very well. Yeah, you have the sun and hurricanes. We have tornadoes and less sun. So, and less mosquitoes during parts of the year. year but all right. I'm going to let this finish printing. Um, it should finish. It sounded like it was doing great. Um, I do not know how many orders they have for the SL1. Hopefully a lot. Um, uh, this is true. <laughs> if we have air that hurts your face, but no bugs the size of your head. This is, this is very true. Um, so, all right. I'm going to let this print. I'll post pictures of the final print if it turns out or not. Who knows? Um, and then I'm going to figure out why I can't get to the admin panel. That's why I sent that email. Um, and then other than that, I hope you guys enjoyed the unboxing. I mean, it was a super quick unboxing. It, 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 when it's built like this, there isn't really much. And the calibration takes 30 seconds. So, um, yeah. Uh, so you can rewatch that first 20 minutes a few times. But... I think we covered everything I wanted to, which is the safety concerns, the, the calibration, how awesome the screen is, the fact you can see it like 100 different angle degrees. Um, so, yeah. Uh, thank you, everybody. I'm going to run away. I'm going to enjoy the rest of the day. You guys enjoy the rest of the day. And I am going to see everyone watch Fun in the Country Basement on Sunday on Glenn's channel, Fun King 3D. So, good night. Stay out of trouble, and we'll see you again shortly. So I have, I have to do another live stream eventually. I'll do the curing a washing station and print handling or something. I don't know. I'll figure it out. So good night.